So we're in this chapter on reacting mixtures and combustion. We've covered the first law. We really need to get to the second law, how to solve problems where we have entropy, entropy generation. And we really are, uh, need to come up with what they call the third law of thermodynamics. And it introduces the concept of absolute entropy. For a reacting mixture, what was our first law? What did it look like? Didn't it look like Q dot in the control volume divided by the molar flow rate of the fuel minus W dot out of the control volume divided by the molar rate, flow rate of the fuel as a sum over all the products? The stoichiometric coefficient. We have the enthalpy of formation so that all of the energy measurements are on the same playing field or same datum points to start it. Reference condition 25 degrees C, 1 ATM, and they picked all of those to have a zero enthalpy of formation that are happy at that point, that, that are like at a, uh, um, how do you say, a low energy state, and that would be like oxygen, nitrogen, the diatomic forms. And then you had uh, pl um, plus the enthalpy uh, at whatever temperature the product is going out at minus the molar enthalpy at the reference 298, 25 degrees C. And then you had minus, I'm going to write it down here, the sum over all the reactants, the stoichiometric coefficient of that reactant, the enthalpy of formation on a molar basis at standard conditions for that reactant, plus the enthalpy at the temperature that the reactants are coming in. You could have two fluid streams for the reactants. Sometimes you just have one fluid stream for the reactant, but you have to know that temperature of each reactant coming in minus the molar enthalpy at the reference, 298. Now we take a look at the second law of thermodynamics. One is we're going to do it only for steady state, so no accumulation depletion. Was the first law for steady state, or is there an accumulation or depletion in the form written? It's steady state. So we're going to write the second law for steady state. You're going to have Q dot into the control volume divided by TB. What is that? A rate at which entropy is transferred in with the heat transfer. Is this the same Q dot CB? Sure, it's the same rate of heat transfer flowing in. And then you're going to have the sum over all of the reactants. Uh, you have the molar flow rate of that reactant. Then you have an absolute entropy on a molar basis for that reactant. And this is where the third law comes in. How do I calculate that S bar? How do I do that? Then you have minus the sum over all the products, what flows out, the molar flow rate fully out, S bar. And then one other term, what is this term? It could have some irreversibilities. You have chemical reaction, definitely some irreversibilities. You have some mixing, definitely some irreversibilities. Okay, so often this term you know, is zero for the heat transfer, or you need to know that boundary temperature, Tb. If I take and divide the whole equation by n dot of the fuel, then you have n dot of the fuel, n dot of the fuel, n dot of the fuel, then what is this group of terms right here? Is that the same as the stoichiometric coefficient? Whoops, put it over here for the, uh, well, put it like that. For the reactants, sure, that's the stoichiometric coefficient. n dot divided by n dot of the fuel is our stoichiometric coefficient in our balanced reaction equation where we leave one in front of the fuel. Okay, so this brings us to the point where we need to find the absolute entropy. Now we're only going to do this for an ideal gas. <coughs> okay, a lot of our reactants and products come in and out as ideal gases. Now if you have a reactant coming in as a liquid at something other than standard temperature and pressure, Forget it. We don't have the skills or time to develop it anymore in this class. <coughs> we don't have the equations or the tools to do it for anything other than ideal gases that are not at the standard conditions. So this is equation only for ideal gas. And so this would be for each component. We're thinking of the temperature and the pressure of that component. Often we don't put a dot on that temperature or the subscript I on that temperature because there's no real concept of partial temperature. There is a concept of partial pressure. So it's this partial pressure of that component piece of I. And so this is uh, evaluated as S bar not I as a function of temperature only. What is that? That's our uh, absolute entropy. If it would be pure, 
gas at that temperature. It's only a function of temperature, but you know the entropy is also a function of pressure, so we continue the equation. We have it on a molar basis, so we use the R bar, the universal gas constant, and then we have the natural log or the partial pressure of I divided by the reference pressure. Okay, now what is our reference pressure? P reference is 1 atm. Remember, reference conditions, 1 atm, 25 degrees C. And often, this PI is just a mole fraction times whatever pressure it is for that incoming or outgoing gas stream. And about 99% of the time, it's very, very common that that is also 1 atm. It doesn't come in high pressure or doesn't go out low pressure or anything like that. It usually just comes in to a combustion chamber, 1 atm, leaves at 1 atm. Hence, uh, you just end up with the natural log of Y sub I. That's that mole fraction in that stream, either coming in or going out. So this is how we evaluate it for the products as well as the reactants. What is this part here? This is just a reminder saying, this absolute entropy is a function of temperature and pressure for ideal gases. Those are the equations I just wrote. They're in the textbook written this way. And often P ref and P cancel because they're 1 atm. You're left with the natural log of Y sub I. Now, people struggled with the common measure for entropy just like they struggle with the common measure for enthalpy, and they came up with what they call the third law of thermodynamics. Don't ask me why this is really rates as a third law. Why don't they just say, here is a definition, and let's move on. You trace back what does it mean to have a law in thermodynamics. It means basically I have to start there and assume it, and then every evidence shows me that it's true under the range of conditions that I want to use this equation. But anyway, they say that the third law of thermodynamics states that the absolute entropy, this is this S bar naught of a pure crystalline substance is zero at an absolute temperature of zero Kelvin. So you think, what was entropy a measure of? Kind of a molecular level disorder or randomness? I know that's not perfect, but that's a good insight into what this property entropy is a measure of. And so if you say, well, at zero Kelvin, how fast is it moving around? It's stationary. Zero Kelvin, I have no molecular energy in the vibration or translation mode or even rotational. That's why they picked the zero Kelvin. It's extrapolated often to zero Kelvin because we usually can't get there. I mean, we just don't get there, okay? So it's a theoretical construct. And then what about this crystalline substance? Well, if you're interested in sort of the randomness of a, of a substance, if you're in a, a crystalline structure, then you know where all your neighbors are. It's not very random. They're all stationary, and I know exactly where they're at in relationship to each other. Where the contrast is amorphous, it's all mixed up. There is no structure in a molecular level. Okay, so they pick that to have zero. There is my absolute entropy. It's picked to be zero, and from there, a lot of people worked on this. They come up with a way to move that up to be able to talk about the absolute entropy of carbon in solid, carbon in carbon dioxide, in different molecule configurations. So the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is equal to zero just restated, and there's no way to get uh, below zero if within this definition of absolute en uh, entropy. That's the third law. Where do we find some of the data? Well, in table A25, for this substance at this temperature and pressure, we know that the absolute entropy is given over here. This is the S bar not in units of kilojoule per kilomole Kelvin. And so uh, you could see that carbon in the solid is very low absolute entropy at 25 degrees C and 1 atm. And then they go up. But all of these are on a common uh, measurement system for entropy calculations. All right. 
What happens if we want to get it at different temperatures for our ideal gases? Well, you would use table A3 and they give S bar naught at a whole range of temperatures. And notice at zero Kelvin extrapolated for the carbon dioxide, there's a zero value. Likewise, for the carbon monoxide has a zero value at zero Kelvin extrapolated, extrapolated. Okay. One thing that's nice is this table A25 is consistent with the da table, uh, data in table A23. So we said oxygen, O2 gas. Here is my oxygen, O2 gas. And it has an absolute entropy of 205.03. And right there is the same numeric value. So that's nice that the data is repeated and they sync up. So you can see it at 298 Kelvin. This is the at 1 atm pressure. Then they have the same S. Likewise, you can go and say, okay, carbon monoxide. Here's the carbon monoxide value. They agree. Here is uh, the water vapor. Here is the water vapor. They agree. And let's finish it out one more. This is the carbon dioxide and there is the carbon dioxide value. That's good. So if you wanted it for select gases at different temperatures, which we'll need, you would uh, interpolate or go down in table A23 at different temperatures and get S naught, S bar naught. Oh wait, so sometimes I get to try and repeat a joke. I can see probably today nobody will laugh or find this humorous or even entertaining, but here's the joke. So we have a relationship between thermodynamics and gambling. Thermodynamics is all about energy. Gambling is all about money, right? And there are some rules in thermodynamics associated with energy. What is the first rule in thermodynamics about energy? In your words, energy is conserved. That's the whole thing, first law, first rule. We can't produce energy, we can only transform it between forms. So maybe we want to convert from heat to work or rate of heat transfer to rate of work transfer, which would be power, mechanical power, but you can't just sort of neglect it. it it's, it's going to be conserved. At the end of the day, there's the same amount of energy. It may not be in the form you want, but the same amount of energy. What about gambling? Well, it's all about money. What about money? When you go and gamble, don't gamble. I'm not promoting gambling. I think it's very destructive. But what is the truth about money transfer in gambling? At the end of the night, the same amount of money. So if you're at a poker table, maybe there's some winners and some losers. But there's the same amount of money that started the day, ends the day. If you think about playing against the house in Las Vegas, you know, the house would be the casino. Uh, either you win and the house loses or you win and the house, or whatever it is, you know, the house wins or you win. Somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to win. Money's conserved. All right. What about the second rule? Well, we studied the second law of thermodynamics. What is that all about? Loosely, the second law of thermodynamics talks about the one-way transfer of energy. There's, there's one-way signs throughout the universe saying this is a preferred direction of transfer. Uh, and in the energy, we could think that, oh, going from heat to work, that's hard. Going from work to heat, that's easy. That's preferred direction of transfer. And we have to be very clever to get some work out of a whole lot of heat transfer as engineers. That's a heat engine, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. What about gambling? Is there a certain rule? Well, it's all about money, and we know that money is conserved, but is there a preferred direction for the transfer of money in the gambling process? Sure is. So the preference is, is for the house to win and you lose. That's the analogy. Now, we are just introduced to the third rule in thermodynamics, the third law. What is the third law all about? It was all about this absolute entropy and having a zero datum point to start the entropy measurements and saying, you know, at zero Kelvin, it's dead 
no molecular activity, no vibration, no rotation, no translation at a molecular level. And in a crystalline structure, it's like no discrepancy. But as things get hotter, you have more molecular activity, higher entropy, higher measurement. So from thermodynamics, it's basically that the, uh, the, there's a zero Kelvin where it's impossible to get any lower. That's the lowest that you can go. All right. What about gambling? Well, you could leave at the end of the night completely broke. Could you not? And the problem is, is you can't stop playing until you get to absolute zero for your money. That's the third law, so to speak, applied to gambling. So hopefully you enjoyed that.